Welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, and I'm here today with Jessica Garlick, lecturer of social work at Hawaii Pacific University. And the topic we're going to be talking about today is decolonizing social work. So hello, Jessica, and welcome to Global Connections. Hi, Grace. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming on the program. Of course. So this topic sounds really interesting, and um, I think it'll be really fascinating to know also about your experiences and this, this uh, concept about social work and, and uh, why it might need to be decolonized. So, so can you give us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in this? Sure. Um, and I think over the course of our discussion, um, it's kind of a journey in terms of how I got to decolonizing social work, so hopefully we can kind of go through some of that today. Um, I'm originally from a small town in Ohio um, and have been in Hawaii since 2003 now. Uh, I came to Hawaii after serving in the Peace Corps in Western Samoa. Um, uh, was at the University of Hawaii for several years in a couple of different positions and just joined HPU's faculty full time uh, in 2016. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And so what were some of these experiences that led you to this, this uh, field? Sure. I grew up in a household where I guess social justice and social work was just part of everyday life. Um, my mother ran an agency um, that worked with folks who were HIV positive as that mm -hmm. was hitting um, the world in the 80s and 90s. Um, so it was something that was instilled in me from a very young age. Um, I went to pursue my undergraduate degree and started out in English, of all things. Um, and at some point during that journey, decided that my passion was really around social work and social justice kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that one of the things that really kind of got me started down that path was a trip that I took with a, a Spanish professor um, to be a monitor for the elections in El Salvador oh, wow. after the Civil War ended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so being able to go um, and see what um, voting looked like in another country to see the conditions that people were living in mm -hmm. after the Civil War. Um, I think for the first time really got me thinking about things in a more global way mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. um, kind of the small town that I grew up in mm -hmm. or the United States as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's interesting coming from a small town but having that exposure to social work uh, mm -hmm. and social services and justice issues. Um, how did, yes, how did you, how did you kind of transfer that kind of a concept uh, through your international experiences? Because I know you're, you're interested in international social work too. Cause right. Um, so I was really lucky to have that experience in my undergraduate education. Um, in graduate school, I was very lucky um, to have two more experiences. Um, mm -hmm. One, um, traveling to Costa Rica um, for an international social work conference. Uh -huh. um, so I was able to go there and kind of learn more about just that concept concept of international social work and to see what social work looked like in another setting and in mm -hmm. another culture. Um, and was also able, I took a class in comparative social policy mm -hmm. um, with a professor and as part of our course we spent three weeks in Cuba um, wow. doing oh. research um, and learning about social systems and social work there. Um, and I think that kind of galvanized um, my experiences and, and my thoughts and really kind of made me want to pursue this um, throughout my career in terms of, you know, taking advantage of opportunities internationally, but also um, helping people understand, even in the United States, that what we do is not in isolation. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the premise of international social work. It's not that you're necessarily working overseas or in another country, but that you're looking at the impact um, that policy decisions um, and other things um, have impact on people all over the world. So okay. um, um, I think most recently, I mean, you can talk about the immigration ban mm -hmm. um, and you can see the impact that it's had throughout the United mm -hmm. States, but as well as uh, the rest of the world. There were at least two families that were supposed to come to Hawaii mm -hmm. who are not going to come here now. And so looking at how that's going to impact those families um, 
those decisions have a big impact, not just locally, but globally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. So, yeah, we hear a lot about people who are coming over, about to come over, mm -hmm. and, and uh, sold all of their things uh, right. and ready to move and, and reunite or reunite with their families here in the U.S., but aren't able to. So, yeah, there's definitely a deep, you know, ramifications of, of the policy. Um, so international social work is kind of something that promotes an awareness of that? Or can you talk about the differences maybe if you were studying social work uh, and then you studied international social work separately? Right, and so I think that's kind of part of what my journey was, was first kind of getting that overseas experience, um, whether that was in El Salvador, whether that was um, in Cuba, um, eventually joining the Peace Corps. Um, and I signed up and, you know, was young and a little naive and, you know, wanted to go to Samoa and thought I had all the tools that I needed uh -huh. um, and walked into a system that was very different than what I was used to. Um, and while my education was valuable, it wasn't necessarily as applicable mm -hmm. as I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. um, social work overall is a very kind of Western-centric model. Um, and it's really about, international social work is really about making sure that other models are honored in that mm -hmm. process, right? It's not just one way. And there's mm -hmm. lots of other systems um, and cultural practices that are just as valid and just as useful. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to employ those tools just like we would other ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are the what are some main differences you've encountered as far as like if you're if you're going um, to a, a separate a different setting and you mm -hmm. assume that the American social work model would work, but what kind of yeah what kind of problems have you encountered with with trying to implement that in a different setting? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it happens both internationally and I think it happens when we work with migrants here. Mm -hmm. um, I guess an example for me was that I spent three years in Samoa mm -hmm. working with families there on a variety of issues, but that context was in a situation where they all had access to land, they all had access okay. to resources. Uh -huh. um, Part of the reason that I got the job that I did when I first moved to Hawaii was because of my experience in Samoa. Um, but I quickly found out that working with Samoan families here was very different, right? Mm -hmm. There was still a lot of misunderstanding about the Samoan community here, mm -hmm. um, a lot of stereotypes um, and misunderstanding, um, as well as a general lack of access to resources. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when you, you know, think about the Samoan community 10 or 20 years ago, um, the discussion is very similar to what you hear about folks from uh, Kofa countries or Micronesia these mm -hmm. days, right? It's the same kind of stigma and rhetoric and wanting to blame, um, but it's, you know, working mm -hmm. with people in the setting that they're in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think working with families here, it's really taking into consideration their cultural beliefs, mm -hmm. right? Who is the person that's responsible for making decisions for the family? Mm -hmm. um, making sure that there's translation services available and those kinds of things. And that's something that we wouldn't necessarily need or think about if we were doing it in someone's country of origin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it sounds like, you know, institutions and our practices, they really emerge out of our particular setting, but international social social work is trying to um, kind of make that model more responsive or flexible to, to mm -hmm. local conditions and, and situational uh, factors. Definitely, and really, you know, I think bridging some of that gap. I mean, there's a couple of social workers here in Hawaii now um, that are from different um, parts of Micronesia and that mm -hmm. region, um, and they're really essential in bridging that gap of understanding on both sides um, and helping um, folks here understand this is how a family setup is and this is how decisions are made. and. Um, these are people that exist in our culture and our community who don't have a social work degree, but mm -hmm. are very valuable in resolving conflicts or providing some kind of healing. Um, and I think that's a big part of, of international social work. Um, and I think eventually decolonizing social work in terms of um, helping people understand that there's not this universal answer for everybody, that we really need to work with um, an individual and a culture um, in a really respectful way and honor their practices and help them access those mm -hmm. um, the same way that we would help them access 
more Western services. Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as internationally, um, mm -hmm. social work models elsewhere in the world, um, their origins, are their origins organic, like coming from their own settings, or do they try to import, you know, existing models from, from elsewhere, and, and how, is, how is that experience, at least initially, before this concept of international social work and, and the awareness of, of these kinds of distinctions came up? Right. I mean, I think that happened very organically mm -hmm. and different. I mean, and of course, it varies largely from society to society. Um, my general knowledge is around the Pacific, right? And uh, many island cultures um, evolved to have structure and very specific roles for people, um, whether it was around medicinal healing and plants and knowledge mm -hmm. versus spiritual health and well being. Um, and I think in the process of colonization, a lot of that was taken away. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of the role of social workers now is to help folks access those services again and access mm -hmm. that knowledge um, so that part of their culture um, is something that they have access to. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. I never appreciated that, that dimension of social work. I mean, uh, if, you're, if you're not in the field of social mm -hmm. work and you don't have a lot of contact um, with, with that service, I think, yeah, the impression is what we get from, you know, popular culture, mm -hmm. which doesn't really address, yeah, like the whole range of different populations, right, that, that uh, social workers work with. Very much so. I think there's um, a really specific idea that people have about social workers and what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think social workers themselves need to be better at kind of talking about some of the other things that we do mm -hmm. um, on a more kind of macro or community um, or policy level. Um, but yeah, I think it's important for people to understand that we're not just doing child welfare. We're not just doing mental health. There's mm -hmm. a, a very wide breadth of things that we do in our profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and given you know how how much uh, immigrants and and you know the second generation make up mm -hmm. you know our our society, I, I think that's probably a lot you know a, a, a big part of it that's not really represented very much. But interesting, yeah, that social work has has really been responding to this, and I can especially imagine yeah with with uh, newly arriving immigrants mm -hmm. or yeah uh, as you were saying earlier with the families that that can't be reunited mm -hmm. there's got to be lots of you know stresses upon them that definitely. are unique huh? definitely um, and we're really lucky at HPU to have um, students from a lot of different countries um, right now I'm working with um, a student from Saudi Arabia as well as a student uh -huh. from Korea mm -hmm. um, the student from Saudi Arabia is working with the Pacific Gateway Center oh. um, and he specifically works with recent immigrants and refugee families mm -hmm. um, and I think because of his position and not having lived in the U.S. for a very long time mm -hmm. um, can really empathize and relate um, and be accessible to folks mm -hmm. um, who are coming here for the first time. Um, and the student that I'm working with from Korea um, is working with an agency that provides adoption services, mm -hmm. um, especially with folks um, and a lot of that is international adoptions mm -hmm. from like China yeah. and Korea. Okay. Yeah. Well, really interesting, Jessica. Yeah. All right. Well, well, stay tuned. We'll come back and speak more with Jessica Garlick about the topic of decolonizing social work. My name is Mark Schlav, and I'm the host of Law Across the Sea. And Law Across the Sea is a program that brings attorneys who have traveled across the sea and live in Hawaii or are staying in Hawaii for a time to talk about their travels, where they're from, where they're going, and bring it all together because really we're all connected some way, although we travel across the sea. So I hope that you'll tune in and watch our program. Thank you very much. I've got the Beagle Sisters here with a healthy tip. We encourage you to enjoy the food you eat this holiday season and keep it local and healthy. Yeah. Eat the rainbow. Eat yeah. the rainbow. And if you need any produce, come to the Red Barn on the North Shore. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Aloha, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, and I'm here with Jessica Garluck talking about the topic of decolonizing social work. 
Welcome back, Jessica. Thank you so much. So we were talking before the break about your experiences and the concept of international social work, its distinction from what I think we typically think of mm -hmm. as conventional social work. Um, but this, this topic that you raise uh, of decolonizing social work is really interesting. Can you say a little bit more about that and, and, and what, that, what that means and why that's, you know, why that's necessary? Sure. I mean, I, I guess I have to first kind of give thanks to actually a profession or a group of um, scholars outside of social work where I really first started exploring this idea. Um, and that was with um, the Center for Pacific Island Studies at the University of Hawaii. Um, they have um, a master's degree in Pacific Island Studies. And that discussion of decolonization is a very big part um, of their education. And I was lucky to take a couple of courses over there. Mm -hmm. um, and in that process, I really started to think about um, you know, how does this relate to social work? How does this relate to social work in Hawaii, right? Um, a place that is essentially occupied by the United States after the illegal overthrow. Um, and so what does that mean and how do social workers work with Native Hawaiians and other allies um, to address those issues, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about addressing things that have happened historically, um, trauma that happens over periods of times um, mm -hmm. to generations of people. Um, and people weren't really talking about cultural trauma 10 or 15 years ago. And mm -hmm. I think more and more um, we're hearing that discussion, at least within the social work um, and mental health arena. Um, but in that process, I, I also developed a course on decolonizing social work uh -huh. um, that I've been able to teach. Um, and a big part of that is kind of just helping people understand colonization and what that process was. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a series of random events. It was mm -hmm. a very kind of planful and thought out process. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to work towards decolonizing, we, there's steps involved in that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of those things for a lot of students, um, many of whom I had that were local or Hawaiian, you know, did not know about, for example, the boarding schools for Native Americans mm -hmm. or know about the lost generation mm -hmm. in Australia. And so helping um, people connect to those different things mm -hmm. um, that were happening, happening around a similar time, um, but what it looked like in different parts of the world. Um, I think uh, as an instructor, it's been mm -hmm. nice for me to kind of see them connect those dots and um, understand that colonization didn't just happen here in Hawaii, it happened mm -hmm. in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. And it looked very different in some of those places. So mm -hmm. the way that it gets addressed is gonna be a little different everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this effort to try to historicize, um, well, some of the, leg and understand the legacies mm -hmm. today Huh, that's very interesting right. about Hawaii in particular. And you have, um, yeah, you were mentioning uh, students you have from a, a range of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so this is, as far as this field of, of work and of study, it's, it's quite, is it quite well represented, would you say, about uh, as far as people, you know, from across the spectrum of American society? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, it's a very diverse group of people, mm -hmm. um, regardless kind of, of age, of ethnic identity, mm -hmm. of gender, of sexual orientation. Uh -huh. okay. um, and I think that's part of what draws people to social work. Um, people aren't gonna wanna do this kind of work if they're not appreciative of diversity um, mm -hmm. and different cultures and those kinds of things. It's in our code of ethics that we have to value mm -hmm. cultural competence and relevance. And so um, those are kind of the laws that, that govern our profession and so yeah, if people aren't excited about that, they're probably not going to enjoy the profession very much. Mm -hmm. and, and social workers are, you know, you teach a course on mm -hmm. decolonizing social work. Do you feel that um, in the profession, you know, in the various settings you've had experience with, has that been achieved successfully or is there, you know, a, a concerted effort to decolonize social work? Um, I think it's happening in a couple of different ways. Um, it's still a relatively new topic to social mm -hmm. work. Okay. Um, it's not something that's being discussed super widely. I think in general, people are talking more about work with indigenous groups, mm -hmm. um, which is part, I think, of that process of getting to discussing decolonization. Um, 
But I think overall, I mean, there's a, a movement within social work educators to talk about what that decolonizing process looks like. Um, I actually have a student right now who's doing research um, and talking to academics about their thoughts on what decolonization or indigenization might look like. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited to see what that turns into. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also at a very grassroots level uh -huh. in terms of engaging with community agencies um, and having that discussion. Um, I think it's just trying to connect people with groups and with agencies that are mm -hmm. doing work that's tied to that mm -hmm. or where colonization is an active part of the discussion mm -hmm. where they're making connections to things that happened historically um, and bring them into present day discussion about how that mm -hmm. continue to in, continues to impact different groups of people. And, and when you talk about people in the social work and the profession, mm -hmm. are we, we talking about people not just working in the government, uh, right. social work, administration, mm -hmm. bureaucracy, but also in terms of organizations as well? Right. How, how are they, uh, how do you think the government is doing as far as uh, compared to maybe some other grassroots or, or social organizations? Well, I think the, the roles are, are quite different in the government setting versus mm -hmm. a more kind of nonprofit or social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, kind of initiative. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot of discussion about decolonization happening <laughs> for folks that are in government positions uh -huh. and that are social workers, okay. at least maybe not at work. That mm -hmm. might be a discussion that's happening elsewhere. Okay. Um, but there are lots of organizations here, um, especially Hawaiian organizations, where there are social workers who are active and a part of that discussion. Um, and where it's being discussed in social work education. So mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, still a relatively small group, but I think it's happening more and more in terms of people paying attention and having the discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's um, something that's very relevant. I mean, and, and it's important for recognizing the diversity of, of our communities around, not only around the country, but mm -hmm. around the world. Um, I mean, this idea of decolonizing, does it extend to, uh, you know, not necessarily immigrant populations or, or uh, you know, indigenous populations, but, you know, I mean, from decolonization, the, you kind of get the sense of you want to decolonize your thinking, mm -hmm. right? Like that is to, to kind of not think in the hegemonic way, right. but think in more um, ways that are more attentive to maybe people who have been not at the center, maybe less, you know, more mm -hmm. on the peripheries of power. Right. Um, and that's, yeah, in the, in the course that I teach, that's one of the kind of sections that we focus on. Um, we focus on a little bit of the history of colonization. Um, we talk a little bit about how that impacts our practice as social workers. We talk about the policy implications mm -hmm. of colonization that are still relevant today. Um, and there's been some great work done by a variety of writers and scholars that have to do with how powerful that colonization process is is on our psyche mm -hmm. um, and how difficult it is to change our thinking around some of those things. Mm -hmm. So I remember, I mean, I often ask students, you know, what would happen? What do you think would happen if Hawaii was no longer a state? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it really takes people aback and it's hard for them to imagine anything else. Like, what right. do you mean? We get all this money and we have this and yeah. um, it's very hard to kind of break that thinking and get it mm -hmm. outside of that box. Mm -hmm. um, not just for students, but I think oh, for yeah. everybody. Um, so I, yeah, regularly challenge them to think about what that might look like. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, can you talk about kind of a, yeah, a, a particular example of how we might decolonize social work practice or a practice that represents a decolonizing effort? Um, sure. I think one of the things that social workers here c can do is really kind of look at what that process looks like um, mm -hmm. and be a part of that um, either through their professional day-to-day -day lives or as private citizens and allies to those mm -hmm. um, individuals and communities that are working on that. Um, Pokalai Nui, who is a social worker here from Hawaii, um, kind of talks about what that process of decolonization is. Um, and that first process is kind of rediscovery mm -hmm. and recovery, getting back in touch with culture mm -hmm. um, and respecting that. I think an example 
example of that here would be like the Hawaiian Renaissance mm -hmm. that happened in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, we're continuing to see that with the Polynesian Voyaging Society yeah. and those kinds yeah. of things. And I think um, there were social workers involved in those different organizations and programs. And mm -hmm. um, that's one way that we can actively kind of support what that is looking like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, as far as the process, this process of decolonizing, mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you envision it expanding? Like the, the discussion and and you know uh, the idea of being kind of more integrated or, or, or helping rethink social work practices. Um, I think it's really having those discussions. Um, and having those discussions individually or in small groups. Um, I think part of this process that is very different than colonization is that it's not a one size fits all and this, mm -hmm. this is not a directive necessarily, but this is about different groups of people determining what this looks like for them um, and for social workers in some situations, right, who are from those different places and of those cultures to really be leaders of that. Um, mm -hmm. And for someone like me who's not from Hawaii or Hawaiian is really just being an ally and supporting people in those endeavors. Mm -hmm. um, and in other situations, you know, just helping people access um, information and sh helping share what they're working on with other people. Um, because I think a lot of times um, there's so much information coming at us at all of the, all of the time and mm -hmm. making sure that people know what's really going on in the community. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so just to wrap it up, um, as far as uh, social work in in Hawaii, you're, you you think that there's been some good strides, and and any any last thoughts about decolonizing social work and where we can go with it? Sure. I mean, I encourage people to. I mean, there's a lot of great information out there. Um, I, a lot of documentaries and there's a lot of groups working on it so I encourage people to find out what's going on locally in their community um, and I think the future is kind of up to us in terms of how we want to see that work out okay great thank you so much Jessica thank you so much for having me you're welcome thank you for joining us at Global Connections here today I'm your host Grace Chang and we're wrapping up a discussion with Jessica Harlock on decolonizing social work see you next Thursday at 1 p.m.